My name is Stu Laurie. I do government relations for Minnesota Farmers Union. We're a grassroots general farm organization. We were founded in 1902 in Texas and Minnesota in 1918. And we came out of the cooperative movement and farmers coming together and seeing consolidation in the folks who were selling them inputs, the folks that were buying their products on the other side, and they realized that they weren't going to get a fair price for the work that they were doing unless they came together and marketed collectively, um, bought collectively, and also organized democratically to elect folks to uh, enact uh, market reforms and antitrust policies. And I think um, I'm excited to work for Farmers Union because we're focused on a lot of those same challenges today. So our members have long recognized that when you have four meat packers that control 85% of beef processing in this country and you got 98% of cattle that are slaughtered at 50 plants, um, that's not going to be fair for farmers and we also understood that it's not going to be fair for workers or consumers either. And um, that's why our organization launched a campaign called Fairness for Farmers. You can look us up online if you're driving around farm country listening to ag radio. Hopefully you'll hear some radio spots from our organization um, trying to raise awareness about the damaging effect monopolies have had on farmers, workers, and consumers. Which uh, brings us to our topic here today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be moderating this panel. If I know anything about antitrust work in food and agriculture, I learned it from these three folks and a couple others. Um, so it's an honor to be here and I'll introduce them briefly before we get started. We have uh, Elizabeth Odette who's an assistant attorney general at uh, uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison's office focused on food and ag antitrust. We do a bunch of work with her and her fantastic team at Farmers Union. We have uh, Diana Tadstead Damer who's director of legislator, legislative and political affairs at the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 1189. I've had a fantastic opportunity to work with her on a number of issues including trying to build a, uh, uh, an alternative uh, meat processing model in central Minnesota, which has been a lot of fun and a learning experience for our organization. And finally, Hannah Bernhardt, farmer and owner of Medicine Creek Farm and someone I'm proud to call a member of Farmers Union. So with that, um, I, I wonder if we could start, Diana, with you, going a little bit out of order. I think the reason that we're having conversations about competition um, in egg markets and having a broader conversation with the public is because of what ho happened during COVID-19. We were slaughtering, we were indemnifying um, 10,000 hogs a day in Minnesota for a few months. Workers were getting sick in packing plants and often dying and I think that um, uh, raised attention to the, the issues that our organizations have seen um, in, in the consolidated meat packing industry for a long time. So I'm wondering if you can tell us more about what happened during COVID and what your organization has done to respond to it. Yeah, so when COVID started, um, it was, well, it was the unknown for a lot of people. And we started doing national calls because what was happening in Colorado was what we were seeing here in Minnesota. And, you know, wherever there was a meatpacking plant, um, it, we were trying to figure out what the employer was trying to do and what our members were facing. And so... Um, what we saw is throughout COVID in the United States when meat packing plants closed down because workers were getting sick, um, Europe did not seem see the same struggle that we did, right? Um, in Minnesota, right, farmers had to kill their hogs and um, lose a lot of, of their profit, right? Um, in Europe where we have um, smaller and more mid-sized meatpacking plants, they were able to um, be more resilient, right, with plant closures. Because if a plant closed in one area, they were able to bring the animals to a different. So they did not see the same struggle as what we saw here in the United States. Um, and then... Um, I just wanna, like, we also represent grocery store workers. And so when COVID-19 happened in our retail stores, um, workers were being um, inundated, right, with toilet paper, right? You couldn't find toilet paper. And if there was toilet paper on the sh um, shelves, people wanted to buy all of it and people would get in fights over it, um, which posed a risk to our members. And so when we were talking about the Smithfield plant um, in 
I, or in South Dakota closing down, they produce 5% of all pork production in the United States. What happens when all of these meatpacking plants that are closing down, which is good for our members to help protect them, um, happen, and what happens when that food is not on the shelves in the grocery stores, right? What happens to our workers in retail? If people are fighting over a lack of toilet paper, what's going to happen when there is lack of food, right? So it was this, um, how do we make sure that we are providing enough um, food for people to buy and so there's not panic that there is a lack of food, um, but also protecting um, our meatpacking workers and our retail workers. Um, and it was just a, it was a difficult thing to navigate. And um, when you talk about antitrust, uh, you see um, you know, Tyson going to the White House and basically writing their own rules. Right, um, and not caring about the workers, not caring about um, the the ranchers. Right, um, they get to just write their own rules, and the government gets to sign off on it, um, which was unfortunate. But um, that's kind of like what we saw and what we were what we were trying to um, navigate. And every day was kind of uncertain. So. Absolutely. That's powerful. That's powerful. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, we'll keep bouncing around a little bit, but I want to go to Hannah next and then we'll go to you, Elizabeth. But um, Diana talked about the impact of consolidation on workers who work in these large packing plants, JBS and Smithfield in Minnesota. You're a farmer, but you don't sell to those plants, right? <laughs> and so how does consolidation affect your operation, uh, selling direct to consumer and the life you're able to create in rural Minnesota? Um, well, kind of actually the story that I told to the Fairness for Farmers campaign to <laughs> National Farmers Union um, is that I grew up on a corn and soybean farm in southern Minnesota. And um, I grew up during the farm crisis of the 80s. And so actually um, during that time, my dad had to take an off-farm job. And of course, who was hiring but farm credit services as they were needing more help to foreclose on other farms. And so... Um, while I didn't, you know, hear the direct stories at the time, I grew up in an atmosphere where um, the feeling was very much known to me and all of my friends that farming is a really difficult way to make a living. Um, so I didn't have a, a totally positive outlook on, on agriculture in general. Um, and I didn't really understand all of the factors playing into it, you know, until I went away to college. Um, and I started learning about how um, kind of the economics worked and learning that, you know, farmers in commodity markets don't have control over the price of any of their inputs. There's very few um, suppliers to buy from and they set the price and you have to take it. And then on the other end, um, you don't have control over the price that you're getting for your end product. Um, again, you have to take whatever you can get. And so really you're farming in a straitjacket. Um, and so I really only, you know, tiptoed my way back into agriculture when living on the East Coast, I saw that there was kind of a new movement of farmers, young farmers, um, who are doing things differently. And uh, you know that was tied in with the organic movement, but it was also um, really based on direct marketing and the community-supported agriculture model. And so this is where I started to see a way out of that straitjacket. Um, and so now I raise grass-fed beef and lamb and pastured pork. Um, I, because of my practices, I don't have to rely on those inputs. I don't have to pay anyone for fertilizer because of the way that I'm raising my animals. Um, and um, I'm not in direct marketing. And so I'm selling all my products to the end consumer um, just through my website. However, I've come to a realization that I still haven't totally escaped um, that straight jacket because of consolidation still. So I can't do everything. While I've added marketing to my portfolio, I can't also find the time to butcher all of my animals and um, meet, do the meat cutting as well. So I have to rely on a skilled labor for that. Um, and unfortunately, because of consolidation, there are very few USDA processors for me to work with. 
And because of that reason, um, you know, I'm really limited to what I can offer my customers. So, um, you know, there's, I can do things one way, but if I want to add a new product, if I want to add um, value added products, which is often a way to make more money, um, I, I really, I have no options. I could drive a lot farther, but also it's really hard to get in to a new um, butcher. You have to have a relationship. I'm booking already a year in advance. So I also, I can't grow. Um, I can't grow quickly, like when the pandemic happens and suddenly I have an influx of customers. I can't just suddenly add more animals. The butcher can only take so many um, and I don't have anywhere else to go. Um, you know, we're also getting into agritourism and so we're going to start an on-farm store. But again, my butcher, because they're already so busy, they don't have any incentive to add more of these value-added products, so I can't get brats and hot dogs to sell in my store and that's what people would be buying out of that location. So, um, so yeah, I thought that I was kind of escaping and yet I'm still finding that um, while I've kind of gotten out on some issues, there's, there's still consolidation affecting my ability to grow a business. Absolutely, and if I could ask you to build on that too, and I think this ties into what Diana was talking about with the supply chain challenges, but I think it's, it's easy to, when we talk, think about market reforms or anti-monopoly policy, it's easy to think about people as farmers or workers or consumers, and that ignores the fact that oftentimes people are all of those things, right? 85% <laughs> of farmers or more have off-farm income that they rely on to support their operation. All the folks who are dealing with those supply chain challenges and angry customers were also <laughs> struggling to find toilet paper, I'm sure. And so I wonder, if, Hannah, if you could say a little bit more about um, uh, you as a consumer, I know you've done work around dollar store building on the last conversation and, and living in rural Minnesota and what mm -hmm. consolidation looks like there. Yeah, um, so in our little towns, um, so my, my town has a population of about 350 people and we still have managed to keep a gas station that has expanded into um, selling a little bit more groceries and a hardware store slash ag store um, and a small cafe. Um, and really this is because of tourism in a way. Um, people are coming up and going to the cabin and so they do want that small town feel. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to build on too with um, agritourism is like this is a region with something to offer and you know we're unique <laughs> place and wanting to draw people for those reasons. However, we've been facing the, the dollar stores trying to move in. So um, we have one grocery store in the little bit bigger town um, called Sandstone Chris's Food Center. And they had a second location in Pine City that actually closed when Walmart moved in. Um, and so now, you know, for the kind of little area of five towns or so, all shopping at this one grocery store, um, there is a Dollar General on one side, and then in the past few years, um, a family dollar moved in on the other side. So it's literally sandwiched between two dollar stores. Um, and then in my town of only 300 people, they also came in and tried to start one there. And then when the city township um, was able to keep them out, they actually moved about two miles down the road and approached an egg ranch, which despite the fact that they had about 20 barns full of um, egg layers, was also going out of business because that's considered too small in the industry to make a profit. Um, and it was only because of, um, you know, citizens paying attention and being active that the township also um, turned them down. So, but that's the thing, you have to be paying attention and you have to, um, just be vigilant and, mm -hmm. and have people really care about your community and what it looks like and keeping those businesses alive um, because it's just relent relentless, you know, they're not gonna stop. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that one thing that I'm passionate about is I think uh, the, the, the business owner from Moon Palace in the last panel talked about 
um, you know, us being in a, a trance or something with regard to Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we sometimes get in a trance thinking that our, you know, believing that we can vote with our food dollar. And okay, I can be against Dollar Store and I won't shop there. And we don't think to talk to our township <laughs> about banning them <laughs> from our neighborhood, which is, which is more powerful. So before we get to Elizabeth and talk a little bit more about the AG, what the AG is up to and um, what tools they have available. Diana, do you want to say anything about the folks you represent as not just workers, but also consumers building on what Hannah described? Yeah, no, um, I think what Hannah described is also um, where are meatpacking um, processors located, but usually in rural Minnesota, right? And um, it's the same thing where um, when you have the Tysons and the Smithfields and the JBSs of the world, um, you know I know Tyson sells to Walmart. Well, Walmart and they a multi you know million dollar contract. And when Walmart comes back to Tyson and says we want X for a price instead of Y, what we've been paying, what happens? Tyson's not going to turn down that contract. They're going to go back to their labor and cut right. So. Um, when we talk about antitrust, it's not just between meat packers, it's also within retailers, right? Like Walmart can squeeze Tyson for a few extra cents per, you know, pound or per package, and then that affects our workforce. And then um, talking about um, the, like, cattle, like when we the number one industry, union industry is pork, and then it's beef. Um, the least union is poultry. So when poultry gets increased, um, the union density is a lot less, so it's harder to keep those union standards of safety and better wages and better health and retirement benefits. Um, so they have less buying power. Um, like workers, right, have less buying power within their own community. So yes, they're working at the plant, but they can't afford to go shop at or buy Hannah's products, right, because they're not earning enough. Um, and if they're lucky, um, maybe they can drive to Walmart if someone has a vehicle, right, um, within their family. Um, but that's another thing is a lot of meatpacking um, places will bus people in, workers in, 40 miles away, um, so workers don't even have their own transportation, right? So like um, they're really owning the labor force um, in a sense, kind of like what Amazon is doing, um, which also, doesn't help the small business owners in small town America. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a trickle down effect and it's just like cyclical, right? Like um, one problem is leading into another, which, you know, doesn't help um, workers or consumers. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, now I'll go into Elizabeth, and I might start with relying on your expertise and maybe from a former gig that you had working in grocery and I trust. And we talked about that some in the past panel, and we've touched on it here. But um, what tools does the Attorney General have, and, and, and what are the opportunities um, to help in that space? Yeah, so I, I practiced antitrust private uh, pl plaintiff's firm um, for about 15 years before joining uh, the Attorney General's office about two and a half years ago. And... Uh, in my former life, uh, I did a decade-long case against some uh, wholesale grocers. So the person sitting in this chair in the last panel, was, his story was so familiar to me because uh, they, uh, independent grocers uh, were increasingly having less choice, almost down to one. And what we alleged in that case was that uh, there were two wholesale grocers who are the ones who drive the trucks uh, into those grocery stores um, conspiring to, uh, you know, allocate customers in geographic territory. So in that case, the, what the grocers were seeing was less uh, choice, but in a, we were alleging that that was deliberate and intentional. And so I think um, we look often at a macro level, but without the stories of the individuals here on this panel and, and uh, previously, um, we can't do our job because we can't gather the facts in, you know, to be able to understand that the intentional and deliberate actions are actually violations of antitrust law. And so um, I appreciate hearing about all the inputs because that was another thing that I was thinking of uh, in coming here today was that, you know, we uh, look at seed, crops, you know, cattle, poultry. So it, it is, like you said, what um, you're trying, who you're trying to sell to 
and then um, what you need in order to bring um, that to fruition. And uh, the Attorney General's office has been looking at it from a variety of angles. We, uh, because the Attorney General was a former legislator, uh, from day one when I joined the office, he said, okay, what laws are working for us, which aren't, if they aren't working for us, let's try to change them. And so uh, we worked to support some laws in, con in the Minnesota legislature. Um, we're gonna continue to look at places where we don't have uh, the right tools or we want the tools to be a little more clear about what we can and can't do when they aren't clear. And so that's been helpful because it also is um, helping people recognize that maybe the existing tools need to be updated. Minnesota's antitrust law was written in the 1970s. A lot has changed since then, especially in our markets, uh, especially in consolidation. And so uh, that's one way. Another way is our uh, federal enforcers sometimes are best positioned to be doing things. So uh, the USDA uh, is undergoing a process because the current uh, administration is looking at antitrust as a government of the whole. And so uh, we, uh, the Attorney General, under his leadership back in December, uh, formed a coalition, a bipartisan coalition, to send the USDA a letter saying, here are some things that you should be doing under the Packers and Stockyards Act, being very specific about what us as states who have more connection to the people on the ground should be doing. And uh, they are starting to take some of those steps. And now, recently, um, they have been making proposed rules to the Packers and Stockyards Act. So once again, under the Attorney General's leadership, a group of 10 states issued a comment, or submitted a comment to some of those proposed rules related to uh, the uh, poultry uh, contract um, grower uh, tournament system. And so hopefully, um, we'll continue to be a, a leader uh, under those um, where we wanna kinda nudge the federal government when we can't directly partner with them on things that are important. Um, I think the Attorney General is going to speak later today and I anticipate that one of his um, themes will be that uh, you know, the public is our partner here and the more we can hear about what people are experiencing on the ground, um, the better we can do our jobs because uh, we need those facts to be able to establish whether or not and to what extent uh, mm -hmm. the antitrust laws are being violated. Absolutely, thank you. And and if, if I could ask you to build on that and kind of broadly, but I know that for the Attorney General, food and ag, and that, that space has been a focus. Um, why has that been a focus for the office, and, and, and what opportunities have you found um, uh, to push um, antitrust action in Minnesota in the food and ag space? Sure, so uh, the Attorney General, he is, a theme is affording your life, and he wants to make sure that every action he does within his office is aligned with that, and it's no greater than the food that, you know, how you can put the food on the table, and that is so important. Minnesota is a huge agriculture state, and he recognizes that, and so our office, when he first uh, took office, um, had uh, two people plus a half a person um, doing antitrust law, he uh, pushed the legislature to expand that to four people. So instead of kind of just managing what we had to manage from a, an international perspective, we can uh, look more locally now and spend more resources there. We've partnered with the Minnesota Farmers Union to have a clerk who's here today uh, doing um, agriculture antitrust uh, research and being able to support our team on that. Um, there are things that our office is investigating that I can't talk about because mm -hmm. they're not public. So just know that we're working really hard. I think that's where it's nice, where we can issue comments and other things to kind of maybe uh, preview what we may be doing behind the scenes. But um, I think that uh, focusing really on um, from the beginning to the end of all of the agriculture systems, I think also uh, there are a lot of mergers going on in this space as well. And mm -hmm. so being able to put resources into looking at those mergers, uh, one of the things that we have been seeing more recently is that um, vertical integration. So companies are acquiring other companies along the supply chain. And so uh, taking a look and encouraging our federal enforcers to take a look at all the levels in which that particular merger may be impacting things. Everything from transportation, like the rail that is required to get you know, crops and other things to and from, being able to understand if a merger goes through, how will that impact each level of uh, the market? So I think, um, thankfully, um, we have added resources. Hopefully someday we can add more. But I'm just continuing to try to lead on this from a Minnesota perspective. 
Absolutely, thank you. And I love, I love the Attorney General's um, tagline, which he's always sure to include, about uh, affording your lives and living with dignity. And when he's spoken with us, he's connected really powerfully um, the, 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 the idea that, you know, if you're a dairy farmer and the company who buys your milk says they're not going to pick it up anymore, or they say they're going to pay you below the cost of production, that's taken away your dignity and, and taken away your opportunity to continue that operation to the next generation. And um, I was with Commissioner Peterson at the Department of Agriculture last night uh, at a county convention after Hannah's, and he said, you know, last month we lost 23 dairy farmers in Minnesota, and that was not an aberration, right? Um, those are folks who, you know, if they're not raising cattle anymore at all, won't be hiring that local vet. Uh, they won't be hiring the HVAC installer. <laughs> they won't be going to the local hardware store, uh, making it tougher, in my mind, for, for, for young par farmers to build a life in that community uh, in the next generation because all those support industries aren't there. And so I wonder if I could go back to Hannah and if you could talk a little bit more about the challenges that beginning farmers face related to consolidation and, and, and the urgency in, in, in addressing uh, market competition for the next generation of farmers. Well, I have a, a similar story to the dairy um, story in that um, another young farmer in my county um, who you know, grew up on a dairy farm and um, wanted to continue to stay in agriculture, but also growing up on a farm, he had some of the same experiences as me, so he wanted to do things a little bit differently. So he convinced his dad to transition to a gr growing organic grains. Um, but when they looked at transitioning the dairy herd to being organic, um, they couldn't get an organic milk truck to drive and pick up milk from them. So now they have to buy in conventional feed to feed their dairy while they're growing their own organic grains. Thankfully, I get to buy those grains to feed my pigs. Um, but, you know, so as a, a beginner, where you are matters a lot in terms of what you have access to. And generally, when you're a beginner, you only have access to land that is not near those facilities you need um, because of the price, land prices. And so um, access to land is huge for beginners. And where land is affordable is often out of range of the services you need. Um, I can say the same thing for like rendering services. So. I can't get access to rendering services for any dead stock. Um, I have to use a wildcat sanctuary that happens to be in my county. Um, so, you know, there's, there's like lots of, from both sides, there's things that are hard to access. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's the issue of access to capital too for beginners. Um, convincing a bank to lend to you when um, you don't have access to the tools you need to run your business is really difficult. Um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and thinking about access to capital, small businesses, Diana, we talked about workers that you represent as consumers and, and building on what Justin asked the last pa panel, but what about potential business owners, <laughs> you know, in rural Minnesota? I think that's a really powerful idea that's, that's harder to realize. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the potential there, what would be needed to create that reality that folks could uh, move into owning businesses independently? Yeah, so um, there is a lot of, um, a lot of meatpacking um, places in rural Minnesota are, you know, aging out and they would like to retire, but then there is no one to buy their um, business. And like the works, the, the, the workforce and the, like the skill is just not there. Like people don't have, one, they don't have the capital, and then second, they don't have the skill to um, work in the industry. Um, so we were talking and um, Stu and I were talking and I know in Ohio, UFCW has a worker um, owned um, cooperative for wholesale it. So they sell um, produce um, in the Cincinnati area. And it, I think it started about 10 years ago. Um, and they have grown, but they've kind of stalled out. They haven't grown past, I think, like 15 um, worker owners. And the one reason they haven't grown is because they can't compete against the Walmart and the Kroger's, right, of the area that can buy produce at a cheaper rate. Um, so 
they've started this worker cooperative, but yet they can't grow because they can't compete with the, un the other wholesalers in the region. Um, so that's a problem. So I think, yeah, mm -hmm. um, worker cooperatives are really interesting because, you know, who has $10,000 to start a business, right? Or, you know, and then pooling resources and what does that look like? Um, and I would just like to acknowledge that I know sometimes people say like, oh, um, um, labor and farmers working together, like, whoa, that's, you know, what? It's crazy. And I just think um, at the previous session, what the Awood, the Amazon worker was talking about how, um, you know, the boss is saying, oh, unions are bad, organizing is bad. They pit workers against each other, right? And they're fighting internally instead of, the company, right? And I feel like that's the same thing what happens um, in R, right? Like they tell the farmers, oh, labor is the reason why you can't get a fair price. Mm -hmm. And they tell the worker who may be undocumented or may, you know, who are, who are just trying to survive, saying like, oh, well, it's the farmers who are, get, you know, like we can't give you more because of the farmers, right? Like they're pitting us against each other and we shouldn't be fighting against each other. We should be unified and say, no, the problem isn't the farmer asking for a fair price. And it's not the worker asking for a safe and dignified um, workplace. It's the it's the company trying to impose these lesser standards on both the farmer and the worker, um, and so that's why, like Stu and I, have been trying to be very collaborative and saying, what can we do? How can we change this industry um, to support rural Minnesota, uh, but also both farmers and um, workers? Absolutely, and. Yeah. And I, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, workers are told to blame farmers and, and, and vice versa. And I think part of the challenge is the lack of transparency in the industry. It's really mm -hmm. hard to tell who's making the gains. We have a clear idea as farmers union, but I wonder, Elizabeth, if you could talk a little bit more about what it takes for the state to build an antitrust claim or a private, uh, a private firm like you did previously, the research it takes, where, 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 where that exists and, and where gaps are in, in getting the information that you need to, to, to build a case against these companies. Sure, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I think, you know, one of the things I didn't previously mention is that often, you know, the public, as I mentioned, can help because uh, usually where the antitrust violations are occurring is where something's happening that doesn't make economic sense. There's a company acting against their own self-economic self interest, you know, like, you know, previously, you know, maybe they're selling something below cost. Why would they do that unless mm -hmm. they were trying to de deliberately harm a competitor? Um, and so that's where I think if everyone out there is just making their own observations in their own communities, they can help us. Um, one of the challenges in antitrust is that under current law, we, you know, there's uh, expert analyses that need to be done in order to assess whether there was harm and then how much that harm was. And so uh, that can get expensive. We're uh, trying to, as I mentioned, explore ways in which maybe the law should be different on that, especially for a public enforcer, because uh, there might be, you know, an abusive dominance standard, like the New York law was proposed, and in Minnesota, we uh, there was a similar uh, bill proposed as well. And so maybe shifting some of those burdens off of the state uh, mm -hmm. or the other federal enforcers and onto the companies that clearly have all of the bargaining power. Um, that is something that, um, you know, I think I heard so many stories of where the bargaining power is just gone and they don't have the ability to bargain anymore because they have one sole supplier or they have one sole company that they can sell their product or their labor to. And so uh, there seems to be at least a better recognition that um, some things need to change. But right now, I think um, we can at least do our best under the existing laws and try to gather evidence use the economic and um, expert uh, resources we do have to bring cases, but the more information we can gather, the better. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, to, to, to build on that with your own idea, but I've also, this is something I'm passionate about as the kid of a mom who ran a small town newspaper, but the erosion of local news and the lack of actual reporting happening in these communities is a challenge for creating that public record too and I've heard you talk about that. Yeah, I was very just going to say, yeah, it. no, <laughs> um, in the old grocers case that I was on in private um, litigation and in previous cases in private practice, we would look up old 
um, you know, news stories on when plants would close mm -hmm. because often local newspapers would report on when, you know, plants would close down and then, then we would have a record of when they closed. And now we don't necessarily have that local news reporting and then it's up to the plant themselves to self-report when they're closing and what that's, you know, reasoning is. So, um, yes, local news is, is a very good resource when they're there. Powerful connection. Well, thank you. <laughs> Round of applause.